us started with today's web event. All right. So welcome everyone and thank you all for joining today's solicitation webinar, OJJDP Fiscal Year 2021 Comprehensive Youth Violence Prevention and Reduction Program Grant Solicitation Webinar. Please note that today's web event is focused on individuals who are applying for the Fiscal Year 2021 Comprehensive Youth Violence Prevention and Reduction Program Grant Solicitation. We will not cover content specifically around comprehensive youth violence prevention, but more so around the application for the grant solicitation on comprehensive youth violence prevention and reduction. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's Intact, and before we get started, I wanted to go over a few items to keep in mind. Please note that we are recording today's web event. Past web events are archived on OJJDP's multimedia page. If you would like any supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. <coughs> if you're having trouble to download that file transfer uh, option that I did where I shared the PDF of today's web event, please note that we will provide a Google Drive if the problem persists. So my co-host has put in the chat a Google Drive where you can access the documents. Please note, you, instead of clicking on the Google Drive link, you may have to copy and paste the link into a web browser of your choice in order to access the document there. If the problem persists, we ask for you to please reach out to the OJJDP TTA Help Desk for any event materials if you continue to have that problem. For optimal audio, we ask that you please dial out through the WebEx uh, phone to your phone line. When you're connected, you'll see a phone icon uh, or a phone headset, excuse me, uh, appear next to your name in the participants panel. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send me, the host, a private chat, and I'll be more than happy to help you with any technical difficulties you're experiencing. During today's web event, we will uh, encourage you all to please provide and send any questions that you have regarding uh, the sections of today's web event uh, to all panelists or to everyone and we'll be able to record your question and address them during our live um, Q&A portion at the very end of today's web event. So again, what you'll do is you'll go to the chat box, you'll type in your question that you have. However, in the to box, before you send your question related to the content, please make sure that you've selected either everyone or all panelists and then hit send or enter, and you'll be able to send your question. And we'll repeat uh, these instructions during the Q&A in the uh, chat. Now, help us count. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing in uh, as a group, please go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people that are in the room with you today. So, for example, if it's yourself and your program manager at your agency, you will put in plus one. Do not count yourself. And again, please send your chat to either all panelists or everyone so that it can be recorded. All right, that being said, I will now turn over today's presentation to Scott. And Scott, you are now in control of the presentation whenever you're ready. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, William. Can you hear me okay? Just want to do a quick sound check. Sounding good. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, William. And uh, again, my name is Scott Pestridge. I'm the program manager with the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, OJJDP for short, within our Special Victims and Violent Offenders Division. And I'll be managing the FY 2021 Comprehensive Youth Violence Prevention and Reduction Program. Before we start, I want to extend my sincere gratitude to uh, each of you today for taking the time out of your busy schedules to participate in this webinar for your interest in uh, 
this um, this initiative. I'll get in the flow here in just a second. Um, so I just want to briefly show who we are as an Office of Justice Programs. This is a the organizational chart for what is known as OJP, Office of Justice Programs. And OGJDP, you can see, is housed under this umbrella agency, along with uh, a myriad of other um, support and funding agencies within, um, within um, the Office of Justice Programs. Okay. And you can see there's uh, six main um, program offices within OJP, um, Bureau of Justice Assistance, many law enforcement agencies are familiar with for their formula and block grant supports, Bureau of Justice, Justice Statistics for the multitude of, of statistical resources that come out um, of that office, the National Institute of Justice for their support of research and, and, uh, and um, around a multitude of um, initiatives across all offices. Um, the Office of Victims of Crime, as well as the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking, known as the SMART Office. So, OGJDP, who are we? Um, well, we envision uh, a nation where our children are free from crime and violence, and if they come into contact with the juvenile justice system, the contact should be both just and beneficial. Um, there's two components to our names that we focus on, juvenile justice and delinquency prevention. And they're both uh, uh, very important components of what is the shared OJJDP. So our mission is to provide this national leadership, coordination and resources to prevent and respond to juvenile delinquency and victimization by supporting states, local communities and tribal jurisdictions in their efforts to develop and implement effective programs for juveniles, our office strives to strengthen the juvenile justice system's efforts to protect, protect public safety, hold offenders accountable, and provide services that address the needs of youth and their families, along with empowering them to live productive, law-abiding lives. So just a brief overview of the agenda for today. Um, we are slated from 2 to 3.30 to include Q&A. Um, we, may, we, we may run short of that, but um, we do have the full amount of time available should we need it. The purpose of this webinar is to discuss OGJDP's FY21 Conference of Youth Violence Prevention and Reduction Program Solicitation to include uh, a program overview, goals, objectives, and deliverables, program eligibility, priority considerations, as well as a discussion of the application process. Again, we thank you for joining us today. And um, we also want to, other than providing a general overview of this solicitation, we do want to highlight key eligibility and solicitation requirements, and also make sure that you uh, are tracking particular tools and resources that were embedded within the solicitation um, that can facilitate uh, your application process. There's going to be a time for questions, as I mentioned, at the end of the presentation. Um, at the, as of yesterday, we had uh, 300 uh, participants uh, registered. I know that's typically not who ends up showing up, but uh, it's, a, it's a fair number of people regardless. So. Um, it's not likely that we'll be able to get to everyone's questions, but I'll do my best to answer as many as I can, especially the ones we received in advance. And I would like to note that after the webinar, you will have full access to our response center, as William has mentioned previously. Um, he put that email and phone number at the beginning of the presentation, and we'll close this presentation out with that information as well. So just feel free to take in the information and be fully present. and. Uh, um, you know, ask questions as, um, you know, we can address those at the end of the presentation. Um, and then, again, if there are programmatic questions that still exist, post-webinar, the response center will reach out to me directly so I can help triage those questions and get responses back to everyone. So the, the, the long and short is that this is not going to be the only opportunity you will have to ask questions. However, 
it is a window currently of this open solicitation that closes in seven weeks from today. That's 49 days, that's uh, seven weeks to the day. Um, so um, I want to, I really do want to encourage you to, if you have substantive questions that potentially will affect your ability to, to fully meet the requirements as outlined in the solicitation, um, you know, it's, it's best to kind of identify that early on and uh, determine how feasible it is for you to, uh, to, to, you know, to meet the requirements as outlined in the solicitation. So we try to do this typically, these solicitation webinars, uh, we like to have them on the street for a couple of, you know, a week or so, um, at a minimum two weeks is ideal. So we're really at a, a good point where you still have an opportunity to, um, to uh, do your storming and forming and figure out what the best approach might be for you. Um, okay, so um, with that, we encourage applicants to submit. Uh, one of the things to remember is the deadline, uh, the deadline. Um, there's two deadlines to remember. Um, it's a two-step process. Um, you need to submit your SF-424, which is your application for, for um, assistance and your um, there's a, another SF um, form that needs to be submitted by June 22nd in grants.gov. This is all outlined in the solicitation. And then your full application, including attachments, no later than July 6th. So June 22nd is your first target for some basic um, um, documentation and July 6th for your full submission um, application to be um, completely submitted. Um, and in order to be considered timely, the application must be submitted in Just Grants by the Just Grants application deadline. With that, we encourage you to submit your application at least 72 hours prior to the due date to account for any technical issues that may need to be addressed when you're submitting your applications. For those of you that are not new to, to um, OJP and the Just Grant system, it's a, it's a fairly new system that we went online with last September. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a growing system. So definitely you want to give yourself a little bit of time for any hiccups that might arise. Okay. Um, and again, everything that we're going through today is a um, clarification or drilling down on items that are on the solicitation. Um, uh, that, that was posted on uh, May 4th. So certainly, um, if you have not downloaded that yet, certainly that would be a great first step. A um, couple things to note, if this is an open and competitive solicitation, um, you know, given that we see a large number of attendees uh, on this webinar today and a large number of respondents with similarly situated solicitations in past years, um, I would, uh, I would expect that we would have a very competitive field for this um, for these funds. So it's important to note that uh, um, for purposes of this solicitation, states means um, any state of the United States, the District of Columbia, or, or any of the five territories. So that's 56 jurisdictions. That's what state means in terms of applicant eligibility. City or township governments, I think that's pretty um, pretty self-explanatory. That would include borough or um, you know or a parish, uh, depending on what region of the country you're from. Um, there, um, it, it, it's pretty open to independent school districts. You, you can read the list that's in front of you here. Um, public institution of higher, higher education, also private. Um, the one thing is that uh, if you if you are a for profit organization, there's a requirement requirement that you forego any profit or management fee. So the, really, the overview of the program is to provide funding for communities to develop and implement prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies that aim to reduce youth gun and gang violence. The overview has the term prevention in it. Um, However, with any intervention or suppression strategy, prevention is inherent. Um, so I just want to make that clear. I mean, in the title of this solicitation is Comprehensive Youth Violence Prevention and Reduction Program. So uh, one very important note, the funding for this 
solicitation requires um, that youth under the age of 18 years be um, the target population. So I think that's an important piece to note. Um, it's something that's come up in previous iterations of, of uh, um, community-based um, violence prevention intervention initiatives that we funded in years past. And it's, it's, it's very important that your, your primary target audience that uh, is being supported through the solicitation is for those uh, under the age of 18 years of age. So this solicitation is um, soliciting applications for um, up to a million dollars. We will award up to 11 applications. Um, and those awards will cover 36 month period of time. So that means that that million dollar, up to a million dollar award would need to cover your activities as described in your application for a full 36 month or three year term. Um, so there's not a supplementation for this. It's a one award for a three year period. So the budgeting needs to reflect accordingly. Um, okay. So the goals and objectives, the overall goal of the program is to prevent and reduce youth violence, including, including youth gang violence. It certainly is a, it is a, you know, a critical focus of the current administration, and it is a, um, one that we um, endeavor to support through this solicitation. Um, so prevent and reduce youth violence, particularly gun and gang violence and victimization, encourage close collaboration among community-based organizations, service providers, and law enforcement to reduce violence and provide alternatives to violence for youth involved with or at risk of involvement with formal or informal gangs. So, um, you know, these, fo these activities should focus on supporting intervention and deterrence focused strategies that aim to reduce youth gun and gang violence. Program elements supported could include street outreach activities, group violence intervention, multi-systemic therapy, and other intervention activities. Um, sites really should employ a multi-systemic approach that harnesses and strengthens existing resources and infuses new resources to fill gaps, which should include efforts to build trust between youth, the community, and law enforcement. Efforts should be focused on areas that are disproportionately impacted by violent crime, including areas experiencing high rates of juvenile crime. The deliverables as outlined in the solicitation require that you develop or enhance intervention and suppression focused initiatives that aim to reduce youth violence, disrupt youth gang recruitment, and offer alternatives to gang membership. There will be priority um, uh, consideration given to the applicants proposing to implement community violence intervention strategies. And these are those strategies that focus on hospital-based interventions, uh, street outreach, um, um, pure violence, uh, those sorts of, uh, of, 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 of strategies. Um, it's not limited to, certainly, but um, it is, as outlined in the solicitation, it will be priority given to applicants that are proposing to implement a community violence intervention strategy. Uh, the programs, um, you need to implement the programs for youth that reduce violent crime, especially in areas experiencing high rates of illegal firearm arrests and homicides. So there should be some data to the extent that you're able to provide data that should be clearly um, included in your um, statement of the problem and your submission. Um, and uh, another key deliverable is really to convene a task force or collaborative working group, which may be an existing group that meets regularly throughout the project period to lead the project, identify and address these service gaps or barriers, and use the funding for a wide variety of, of intervention and suppression strategies targeting youth who are at highest risk for violence. So, um, you know, one thing that I that I think is really going to be important, and we're getting a lot of questions in the pre 
um, submission of questions was around like, uh, you know, what are some, what are some good strategies? What are some effective ways to address um, violence in my community? And the reality is, is that uh, it's going to be pretty um, subjective to your particular need. Um, the particular model that you're looking to stand up. Um, we'll go over some resources that we identified in the solicitation that you can use to try to pull from. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk through that a little more as we um, as we get into the Q&A portion. But I'm going to keep this a little broader, but just, just for the moment, though. Um, in terms of training and technical assistance, um, oh, and I do want to go back one, one second real quick. So why, while in this previous slide, um, it, the deliverables talk about um, um, a variety of prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies. The reality is, it's really your intervention and suppression strategies that we want to see um, within the communities. Prevention is necessarily going to to occur when you stand up an intervention or suppression strategy. So I just want to make that point. Um, in terms of training and technical assistance, we support, OGJDP supports the National Gang Center in providing training and TA to uh, funded sites uh, that address youth gang violence. So sites that are funded through this solicitation are expected to, expected to work with our National Gang Center and also expected to participate in up to three-day cross-site meeting for each year. So that means nine days uh, over the course of the 36 months, three for each year. Um, with three representatives attending each year up to. Um, I, the reason we put a fine point on that particular bullet in the solicitation is, um, or in this webinar, is because we want you to appropriately plan as you submit your budget narrative um, to plan for that particular piece. In the event that we are able to have an on-site um, meet, meeting, um, that would affect your, uh, your bottom line in terms of travel costs. So I want to make sure that's done. That's uh, made clear as you pull your pieces together. Um, as we get into the general overview of the grant application process, you know, one of the questions we got uh, a couple uh, repeats on of, of, of people wanting to know ahead of time is like, what are some of the pitfalls people fall into in terms of submitting an application? And, and I think one of the primary ones is not not fulfilling the the basic minimum requirements of what needs to be submitted. So um, if, if you look here, um, now that we have a basic understanding of the requirements of the solicitation, which again, gives you a ton of room to identify specific strategies that you want to employ and make the case for in, a, in an application. Um, now we need to understand, um, you know, what is the grant application process? Um, and I know it can look a little overwhelming, but the purpose of this webinar is really to help ease that stress and help you digest everything that you'll need to do to submit a comprehensive and thorough application. So you can see various elements from, um, and what we have these listed out. This is just a little visual to break up a little luminosity on this um, presentation today. There's a there's an application for federal assistance, which is called a standard form 424. That's the one component. Um, there's a, a basic uh, general agency information piece you need to submit. The project abstract and narrative are, are um, you know, critical first elements. I would imagine most of you on this call today have a draft sketch of an abstract together already, and you're trying to figure out how to build that out to a more uh, robust narrative with, uh, with, with um, elements to fund through a budget worksheet and budget narrative. Um, so all these are elements of an application and what it needs to include. If there's an indirect cost rate, if you have one, uh, that needs to be included. There's a financial management questionnaire. Um, there's a link um, to our OJP financial guide that um, can, can get you a lot of resources on what are the requirements um, financially in terms of, um, you know, should you receive, um, be successful in um, applying for one of these awards? You know, what are the conditions that you will have to follow? and what conditions you would have to convey to any uh, subrecipients. Um, but I don't want to get too far ahead. And again, as I mentioned a minute ago, this can be overwhelming and the purpose is to ease that stress. So I don't want to get too in the weeds 
I just want to go over just some of the basic pieces. Um, if there is a, um, a research uh, independence and integrity, an evaluation independence and integrity statement to the extent that you're doing research that needs to be included. Um, if there, if, if you are focusing on community violence interventions, um, you know, you need to highlight that piece and we'll talk a little bit more about CDI in a, in a, in a minute. Um, but you need, or if you are focusing on high poverty area, persistent poverty counties, you'll want to uh, highlight those pieces as well, because those are priority considerations um, that we'll take into account as stipulated in the solicitation. Uh, there's a lobbying activities uh, form that these are all links to the checklist of the that, um, PDF, uh, that 15 page PDF um, that uh, posted on the 4th of May. Um, and then, um, you know, making sure that you're being real clear about if you have any pending applications for similar type services um, being submitted. And uh, it's, it's just being disclosing that is uh, an important an important component of the submission process. And then um, if you are high risk, um, making that, disclosing that, um, and you would pretty much know that there's a pretty distinct list of, of high risk grantees. If you are, have never received an award from, from DOJ, um, necessarily you're not gonna be on the high risk list. Um, those are for existing grantees, so it may not be applicable. So uh, I'm gonna move on and just talk a little bit about uh, basic minimum requirements. So we call this BMR, basic minimum requirements. It's like, think about it when you go to your, um, you know, um, to, to renew your license, there's certain things that you have to have and if you don't have those things under no circumstances is the Department of Motor Vehicles or Motor Vehicle Administration are they gonna let you kind of move to the next step to get what you need, whether it be titling the vehicle or a license or whatever. So these are these are the basic minimum pieces for us to advance your application to peer reviewers, which are um, you know, individuals that will be reviewing and rating your applications to be considered for funding. And we have seen it where there is not a um, a budget narrative. There's just a budget worksheet, or vice versa, or there's not a um, yeah, um, an abstract, and you have a really in-depth narrative. Um, but that would make you ineligible to kind of be advanced to peer review, and that can be very frustrating. Um, so I just, if there's the biggest word of caution to anyone that's really considering going down this road that has not gone down the road in the past, is to really make sure you meet those basic minimum requirements so that you can at least make it to peer review so that you can get some candid feedback about strengths and weaknesses of your application. Because uh, believe it or not, over my 23 years of federal service, I've found that, uh, that many sites and many applicants have really appreciated, non-successful applicants I'm referring to have really appreciated comments that they've received as a result of the peer review process and use in utilizing those comments to strengthen their applications for subsequent um, initiatives where they were successful. So um, that's my my one minute soapbox. Um, so um, in terms of this um, standard application, the 424, this is a standard form that uses a cover sheet. That's an important piece. Um, it's submitted in grants.gov. Um, we talked about your deadline for that. Um, um, and that's also outlined as uh, June 22nd. So you have just over a month to get that portion of it in. Um, and it's a lot of pre-populated data, um, as you'll see, as you see there. Um, but you need to add in that you know, kind of zip codes for areas affected by the project. So you need to be thinking about those targeted areas. Um, um, confirming your authorized representative, verifying organization's legal name and address. Um, just a lot of stuff that helps make it much easier to identify and move you forward in the process. So a proposal abstract, um, 400 words or less, 400 maximum, written for a general public audience, this is not an easy task when you're looking at a 
changing the lives of, of our nation's youth in very meaningful ways, it can be very difficult to kind of get that down to the to the essence. But it is really important that you do so because it's it's something that is utilized by by us as that potential funder to articulate your big term vision. So um, this is a really important piece that includes your primary activities, your products and deliverables, service area, who's going to benefit. And again, that's a web-based form completed in just grants. And this is a public facing document if you were to be awarded. So it's kind of your elevator speech, we'll call it. Um, and um, this is done in just grants as a web-based form this year, not as a separate attachment as it has been in previous years. So for those of you that are not first timers, um, this will be a first timer for the web-based just grants proposal abstract submission. The proposal narrative, 30 pages maximum, double space, 12 point font, and then you have to include the description of the issue, the project design and implementation, capabilities and competencies, and plan for collecting the data required for performance measures. Um, now, you do not have to, you do not have to um, speak to performance measures. Frankly, performance measures are currently, you know, um, being developed um, and will be rolled out um, subsequently. So I think that uh, you need to be able to speak to how you would collect um, and be able to address measures. And there, there is a link on um, in the in the solicitation that will take you to a performance measures uh, uh, website where, where you can kind of see some of the general types of information that uh, you would need to collect. So um, you'll want to take a look at that. Um, again, given that this is a very competitive solicitation, you need to do your best to comply with all the requirements. Um, the description of the issue. Um, this is where you're just describing the nature and scope of the problem um, that the program will address using data to provide evidence that supports that the problem exists, demonstrating the size and scope of the problem and docu documenting the effects of the problem on the target population and the larger community. Describe the target population in any previous or current attempts to address the problem and identify current gaps in programming and services. One thing I would just mention is that I, you know, I think it's, it's sometimes much more simplistic to focus on a particular area within a um, region um, to address uh, our community, to address uh, a pilot project. If you're looking to endeavor an initiative that has not been undertaken before or expand on one, um, it's much more difficult and overwhelming to look at a, uh, a county-wide or a system-wide effort um, given um, just given the nature of the funding uh, and the, the scope of the 36 months, um, you know, it's really important that you that you set realistic um, size and scope expectations, I would say, around that, you know, how you want to uh, develop your program. And that's for you to decide, but I just I want to encourage you that, that um, you know, a focus on a specific community with a defined need is quite sufficient. Um, and, you know, whereas, uh, you know, implementing, focusing on a statewide piece that may not be implementable at all, you know, um, maybe isn't, wouldn't be the best approach, but again, that's for you to decide as you, as you develop this with your stakeholders. Um, but one thing that you need to do is, uh, you know, describe that target population and previous or current attempts to address the problem and current gaps, I think, and how you're going to address those gaps. I think that's an important piece. In terms of the proposal narrative continued, um, how you will operate throughout the funding period and the strategies that you will use to achieve the goals and objectives, um, and um, looking at any leverage resources, whether they be cash or in kind, that you identify those and a very clear timeline that indicates major tasks associated with the goal and objectives of the project as a separate attachment. So we do not require a funding match, but if you plan to include it, uh, you need to detail it, and um, you will be kind of held to um, 
any sort of, uh, whether it be cash or in kind, if you do include it and in it's not required um, that you have cash or in kind, but if you do include it, um, it's something that our chief financial officer will review and include as part of your approved budget. So then you'll be held to that in kind or cash um, resource throughout the course of your award, should you be successful. And that's, that's just one point to note. Um, so looking at uh, making sure that you look at the uh, experience and capability of your organization and any contractors or subgrantees that you're going to use to implement and manage the effort. Um, and so this is a great place to highlight under capabilities and competencies, any previous experience implementing projects of similar design or magnitude. Some say this is a catch-22 because you may not have had a similar design or magnitude, but um, the sum of the parts may reflect otherwise. You know, you may be able to very easily articulate strengths um, of various components of a, of a community-based consortium where, where you're able to kind of highlight substantial experience reflective of the overarching initiative that you plan to uh, endeavor that will um, adequately address um, experience, whereas uh, individually you may not be able to. Just, uh, just one thing that I want to encourage you to really look at uh, in maybe potentially slightly different way as you look at this funding stream. Um, it's very important that you look at the roles and responsibilities of your project staff and look at the organizational structure and operations. Um, one big thing, we want to make sure that there is not supplanting, which is where you are funding something that otherwise would have been funded. It's very important that you're enhancing or creating something um, that is that is enhanced or otherwise non-existent were it not for this funding. I mean, that is the point that this funding is creating these opportunities, um, these partnerships, these programs, whatever it is for you in your community. Um, your organizational chart, that's an important piece. And uh, if you are submitting a joint application, certainly not required, but some do decide to submit a joint application, um, you need to provide um, uh, letters of support or MOU for all the key partners. And there is ultimately going to be one primary applicant, um, and that applicant is the one that will be um, the one that uh, has to um, respond to all of the financial and programmatic requirements um, that are required, and that ultimately will be the liable organization, so to speak, with all this. So that's just one thing to note. Um, so on collecting data required, here's the performance measures link um, that's pulled from our um, solicitation. Um, again, you do not have to speak to the measures. You just have to be able to speak to, um, you know, how you will gather those, that data should, it, should you receive funding, that you have that kind of capability to, to kind of garner and gather that data. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, bear with me. Um, so this um, this Just Grants web-based budget form. This is. Um, hang on, I just want to. I need this too big. One second. Okay. Um, the budget narrative needs to thoroughly and clearly describe every category of expense listed in your budget detail worksheet. And this really does take some time and um, some know-how to, to do properly. There are samples that are included in the solicitation um, link, uh, link it, and you'll be able to see those. Um, but under each category, there's a narrative section to detail what the costs will be used for. And that's really important to complete that and that it's consistent with um, the numbers above it because it, it, it's the sum of the parts. It's how you get to the to the one thousand. You know, it's um, it, it's it's breaking that down by by um, stipulating particular hours and 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 staff time that sort of thing. Um, so the, the links to the financial resources guide, uh, financial financial guide explains what we will fund, what we will not, and what you will 
work with your program manager on for additional questions. And so we're looking for reasonable, allocable, and necessary for project activities. Um, successful applicants are expected to, again, participate in this three-day cross-site meeting, so you need to make sure that you budget for that in your worksheet and your narrative. Um, and again, if you don't need it, um, you can always, you know, we can figure out how to, you know, utilize it uh, um, accordingly within your, um, you know, within your approved budget. However, um, it, it, we want to make sure that it is included in your initial submission so that um, it'll minimize uh, back and forth uh, in getting what we call a budget clearance if you are successful in receiving an award. So um, some additional items. Uh, the indirect cost rate agreement, um, and that's if you are seeking an indirect cost rate agreement, you have to have a current unexpired federally approved indirect rate and attach that rate agreement in just grants with your application. Um, so it could be a provisional rate, it could be, but it needs to be a current rate that covers a current period. Um, financial management questionnaire is required for all applicants and you download that questionnaire in Just Grants and you submit it by uploading the completed questionnaire as an attachment in Just Grants. You may find that if, you, if you're on this call and you feel that if looking at the financial management um, questionnaire that you feel that you're just unable to um, adequately meet the requirements or answer the questions within that questionnaire, then it may, that, that may be an indication that, um, you know, to, to look at partnering with an organization that has the capacity um, and the, the ability to meet those financial requirements um, is, is something that you might consider. Um, we have had many great partnerships forged through the application process in past years, I will say that. Um, if you are a tribe, tribal organization or a third party that proposes to provide direct services to residents on tribal lands, you need to include a resolution letter, affidavit or other documentation that demonstrates you have the requisite authorization from the tribe or tribes to implement the proposed project on tribal lands. Um, there's a research and evaluation independence and integrity statement that's uh, if it's not a research project, but if you're proposing research, including research and development or evaluation, you must show that any funding used for research and evaluation demonstrates independence and integrity, including appropriate safeguards before you re receive the award. And so if this is applicable to you, you would submit a description of the research and evaluation independence and integrity by uploading the document as an attachment and just grants. If it's not applicable, then you just move to um, the next one, this is going to be applicable to everyone. The disclosure of lobbying activities. Um, everyone must submit this disclosure, even if you're not expending any funds for lobbying activities. When you fill out the form, you enter not applicable or NA in the text box for item number 10. However, um, you need to make sure you have this form, even if you're not expending funds for lobbying activities, because it is a critical piece that we want to make sure that you have included in your submission. Um, disclosure of duplication and cost items. Um, this is also important to make sure that you're um, duplicating efforts or supplanting funds. I mentioned that earlier. So make sure you disclose if you have or you're proposing um, as a, you're proposed as a subrecipient under any application for federal funding that includes requests for funding that would support the same project being proposed in this application or would cover any identical costs. So. Um, just disclose that and if, if that's the case. And it's, um, it's a web-based form that's to be completed in just grants. Um, and uh, we talked about the high risk. If you are a high risk grantee, um, you submit a separate attachment with your application um, stating that. Um, let's see what else. I'm going to try to get through this a little more because I want to make sure we get to Q&A. And it looks like I'm lagging here. Okay, so um, timeline, make sure it's realistic and it has, um, you know, milestone chart. It can have milestones or, um, but it should be, have a time indicator to those uh, major tasks um, and assigns responsibility for each. And uh, there are samples of the timelines and the links through the uh, solicitation as well. 
um, letters of support if you're submitting a joint application. You're, you're welcome to submit letters of support regardless. Um, but um, you know, if you are if you are submitting a joint application, that would be um, something you want to include definitely. Uh, position descriptions. These are position descriptions specific to key personnel for the implementation of the initiative as being submitted and uh, resumes for those individuals was, um, for proposed. Now, the reality is you may not be able to hire an individual until you know that you have funding and then you can start the hiring process. Um, all the more reason to have the position description filled out so that you are, will be ready should you be successful to articulate fully the type of individual you want to seek for fulfilling that um, grant funded position. Okay. Priority areas, uh, we talked about this a little earlier. Um, if you can demonstrate ways in which your project will uh, um, implement a community violence intervention strategy, this is a community-based violence-based uh, gun violence intervention, such as street outreach, violence interrupters, group violence intervention, hospital-based violence interventions. Um, you know, you can uh, identify that and, um, and 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 mark that and 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 underscore that in your in your application. Um, and if you are looking to focus on um, um, particular communities that are, um, are going to be benefiting from this uh, um, services of this award uh, that are including high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties. Um, you'll want to identify that as well, um, as that is a priority area for the um, administration as well, and they will take that into consideration, but you need to articulate that. So I think that this is an important slide for you to, uh, you know, these, these couple of priority area slides are important ones for you to look at. It doesn't mean you're required to focus on these pieces by any stretch, but if you are, I think it's very important that you make it clear abundantly clear that you are. Um, so you need to provide sufficient narrative explaining this, um, how your project will advance the promotion of civil rights, access to justice, support to crime victims, protecting the public from crime and evolving threats, or building trust between law enforcement and the community. If um, that, that's something that if, um, if you're doing one of those things, you need to uh, articulate that clearly so that so that that can be brought to the uh, reviewer's attention as they're um, as they're reviewing the applications. Um, under that community of violence intervention priority, you have to provide a sufficient narrative that describes one or more community violence intervention strategies that will be implemented with funding and how they will be targeted to reduce violence. Um, and under the poverty priority, um, providing information that demonstrates that you are um, actually working within a community that has um, um, high poverty, whether it be in a community, in an area, or a county, being able to articulate that. Okay, so the selection process. If you met the basic minimum requirements that we went over earlier, you'll be evaluated by peer reviewers using the breakdown of, of this, um, this percentage point. They'll look at the description of the issue and they'll identify a score. Um, the same for project design and implementation, same capabilities and competencies, plan for collecting data, uh, and budget. And based on your some your numbers, that they're proportionally addressed over the those uh, percentages that are listed there. So clearly, um, if you had a weak project design or a weak capabilities and competencies, you're likely to um, affect your overall score. Um, um, a little more substantially than if you had a weaker plan for collecting data. And so again, I just want to make sure that that that's understood. Um, so let's see. Um, so we are committed to ensuring a fair and open process for awarding grants. And so we want to make sure that uh, you know, everything that's understood is measurable, achievable, consistent with the solicitation. Um, peer reviewers 
will um, will review the applications to make sure they meet the basic minimum requirements. We may use internal peer reviewers. We may use external peer reviewers or a combination to review the applications. It could be um, it could be either of those three scenarios. Um, so um, closing up on some of this because um, I do want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, the two deadlines, of course, June 22nd is the first one. If you don't meet that deadline, then there's no sense. There is no July 6th deadline because you will not be allowed to move forward because you will have not met your previous deadline. If you encounter an issue in, with the system, yeah, communicate that early. The only way you can communicate that early is to apply prior to the deadline. If you tried to submit at 11.58 p.m. on June 22nd and you had an issue, it's a little more difficult to communicate the issue and have a window to address it. So I just want to, I just, I really want to underscore the, 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 the importance of submitting the applications prior to the due date to allow for you to receive the validation messages, the rejection notifications from grants.gov, and so that we can correct in a timely fashion any problems that may have caused the rejection notification. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'm just going to squeeze through a couple of these. Uh, so a DUNS number is, um, if you don't have one, you need to get one uh, by calling uh, Dun and Bradstreet um, or going to their website. Um, uh, many, uh, and if, if you're a previously funded organization, necessarily you have a DUNS number. Um, if you're a first time applicant, you likely um, you may or may not. Um, so this will be a, a, a good first step and a, pre, a key critical piece to look at if you feel that you, uh, you know, have a competitive uh, inability to, to move forward with the solicitation requirements. Um, you know, this would be an important piece to look at. And then there's a SAM, the System of Award Management, um, where you need to um, register. And there's information on how to do that if you have it. Um, uh, we do encourage that you sign up for grants.gov email notifications, um, and um, that way you can be notified um, of any sort of updates. And um, again, late applications are not accepted unless there's a problem with grants.gov, sand.gov, or just grants on our end. Um, a problem on your side will not result in a waiver. So, and really, this is a learning process for many. So. We want to give you that room to grow in terms of that learning curve. So that's the only way you can really do that is to is to get some of this stuff in ahead of schedule to ensure that you're able to meet any unanticipated issues that might arise. Here's a, an amazing technical assistance number for you to kind of keep in your pocket if you're hopefully there's a few of you that are sitting around the table, whether it be virtually or in person, that are looking at each other with excitement. Um, with this uh, seven week window to create some fantabulous uh, um, comprehensive youth violence prevention and reduction programs that will support your community. Um, that These resources, such as the technical assistance resource that you see here for grants.gov, that, that you have that in your back pocket because um, you want to be able to address those quickly. Just grants, which is the second portion of the Submission process. That's the, the um, July 6th, no later than 11:59 date. That, that's the information for that. Um, in terms of any issues that you might have, some resources very quickly. Um, there's some great links for grant writing tips um, from our Bureau of Justice Assistance sister agency. There's some great evidence-based practices identified under a OJJDP model programs guide and as well as the OJP Crime Solutions .gov. Uh, there's a What Works Clearinghouse. These are all, um, you know, we had a couple questions about what works really well. These evidence-based practices are all great practices that are evidence-based, uh, you know, um, they, they, they're community-based um, models. I think that um, you can really look at those as potential opportunities, but I would like, I, would, I would, wouldn't be surprised if many of you already have a pretty good sense of how you might try to move forward in terms of addressing some of these broad brush um, deliverables that are in, outlined in the solicitation. So the National Gang Center is a key resource 
um, for um, for our office. Um, you know, it has a ton of information around uh, you know um, uh, outcome driven practices that engage and empower communities with chronic and emerging gang problems. Looking at really comprehensive community approach and uh, looking at assessments and all of the right pieces that really can help you kind of move forward in terms of thinking of how to how to really um, move the dial on uh, reducing crime in your community. Um, so I, I, I'd say there's so that's a resource that if you haven't explored, I definitely would encourage you to uh, because you're that's just a, it's a lot of data. So you really um, need to do this exploration, I would say as soon as possible so you can land on your approach. And the comprehensive uh, gang model is is our gang model that really the National Gang Center stands up through um, um, the strategies of addressing serious violent and entrenched youth street gang problems. And it's really uh, um, a, a, great, uh, a, a great model that includes suppression. Um, it includes intervention, prevention, um, and just a ton of uh, interface with um, CBOs to really help uh, help address issues that you might identify as needing to address. Youth.gov also has some great resources. Um, there was a national forum on youth violence prevention, also known as the forum, uh, that was created um, some time back um, to build capacity of localities to more effectively address youth violence. Um, through these multidisciplinary partnerships and data-driven strategies. And uh, so there's a link there that might be helpful. Again, many of you may be familiar with some of the National Forum initiatives uh, that have may have been embraced within your community. Um, connecting with OGJDP, we have multiple platforms. Um, I'd say the one that, that I'm not so technologically um, um, Connected the one that I that I use heavily is the newsletter and Juve Just, um, but certainly there are the uh, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube as well. Um, the Juve Just is definitely a great resource if you're looking to be made aware of uh, funding opportunities as they become available. Um, you can kind of get right out there and know exactly when they're kind of coming out. So you also receive many other um, emails on various. Uh, a delinquency prevention and juvenile justice uh, initiative strategies uh, information that you might find helpful. So with that, it looks like we have, we're at 30 minutes before we close, which I think is good because that's the minimum I wanted to have for Q&A. But before we go there, I do want to just say that, um, you know, I, I, again, there were several questions that came up in the preliminary questions about that. Uh, you know, what program should I or should I, should I not be doing? Um, and really, we can't get into the specifics on that. That's going to be for you to tell us what the problem is, what the issues are, what you've done to address it, and kind of how, if these funds were awarded to you, how you would be able to really move that dial on, um, you know, uh, violence um, reduction within your community for your youth. Um, and I think, you know, how to fill in those gaps, I guess, really. Um, so I think that this is intentionally is pretty broad because it allows you to kind of identify your resources, your needs, your strategies, your barriers, and your champions as well. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, um, that's all for me. I know it was plenty. I appreciate those that stayed on the phone. I think out of the, we have 127 participants still on. So I think I might have dropped a few of you, but um, but thank you for, for all those that have diligently stayed on. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to William. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, so before we get into those pre-submitted questions that came in, a couple of housekeeping for some folks who may have come in uh, a little late on the line uh, or who had uh, some questions uh, that were sent directly to me. A few things to keep in uh, in, um, in consideration. Uh, and Scott, I'm going to go ahead and just take over the presentation really quickly um, because I'm going to actually do a quick file share. So for the people who came on who were saying that are asking about the location of the PowerPoint, uh, I'm going to do the file transfer again. So just on your screen just now, you should see a box. 
that comes up on your screen, okay? In that box, I'm putting the PDF of today's web event, okay? And in that PDF, you'll be able to go in, open it, and then you'll be able to actually click in the links that were displayed throughout Scott's presentation today. So simply, again, go download that item. You will just click on it, click download, and it will download to the device that you're joining from right now. And then it, inside of that document, you'll see those clickable links throughout the presentation that Scott just showed there. And that's how you can access those resources. Uh, we saw a couple of questions, Scott, that came in about getting access to the resources. And so I just wanted to make sure I shared that again with folks there. Um, oh, also, great. yeah, and also er everyone should note that in the uh, chat just now, my co-host put a Google Drive link. If you go to that link and you can simply either click on it or you can copy and paste it into the web browser of your choice, uh, Google Chrome, or Microsoft Edge, uh, Internet Explorer, whatever it may be, go ahead and copy and paste that into your browser and then that will give you access to the same file that I'm sharing right now with you too. So note that we're giving you multiple ways where you can access this file. If you're having any trouble with accessing any of these, whether you can't download it uh, through the file share I just did, or you can't access it through that uh, Google link that my co-host just put up, uh, please contact the uh, OJJDP TTA help desk, and I'll have my co-host to put in the help desk information there. So you can contact us there if you're running into any issues accessing those documents. Now, for those who have questions specifically, again, about the uh, solicitation, as you can see on the Q&A here, uh, uh, on the Q&A slide here with Scott, we do have the information for the response center, and my co-host will also post that information for the response center in the chat as well to folks. So any questions that we did not get a chance to answer today or uh, we need to to later on, please note that we're asking you to please send that information over to the response center at the information that you see again on the slide and in the chat there. And then finally, uh, this web event is being recorded, like I mentioned in the beginning, and it may be posted. Um, we've posted the uh, location on the OJJDP multimedia site where it will be located, but we'll post that again for the folks who may have missed that or come in a little late. Um, so thanks, Scott, for that time right there. We'll go right into the Q&A because those, uh, I believe, addressed about 20 to 30 percent of the questions that were coming in during today's uh, web event. The uh, first part here, uh, what are best practices when working with youth and gang violence? Sure. So, I mean, it can be very different for um, very different communities. Um, yeah, it's um, it depends on what your you know what your if have you had an assessment in your community to determine what you know might be the you know the driving force or the or the major major issue to kind of to move forward with. I mean, I think that it's going to be very very different for different communities based on um, resources, uh, both um, at certain impediments that may exist. Um, and so I think that um, the reason that we we highlighted on this in the solicitation, the National Gang Center. Uh, we also highlighted the um, uh, what else did we highlight? We highlighted uh, some great information around uh, the comprehensive gang model, as well as um, the National Forum and uh, Youth.gov. There's a ton of there's a ton of ways that. People can focus on, um, you know, that, what, where models can work really well. The comprehensive gang model, though, really is um, a framework, and I'd encourage you to look at that on the National Gang Center's website. That looks at coordinated action that improves the community's capacity to prevent youth from joining gangs and reduce street gang crime and violence, whether emerging or entrenched. But the idea is, what does that look like? I mean, you can't just say writ large you're going to implement a comprehensive gang model, you would say, maybe I want to focus on the, um, the street outreach component of, um, you know, of, of addressing uh, the current um, issue of gang violence within my community. And that would be an example of, I think, something that would be a, um, 
you know, a realistic piece of the of the larger, um, you know, conversation, you know, um, so I think it could look very different based on, you know, based on what your community um, uh, is struggling with. Um, you know, if you look on the National Gang Center website, too, there's a, uh, you know, there's a piece on, uh, there's a matrix of programs um, uh, that I, I, I think we sent the link or we can get to the link for that, you know, identifies, um, you know, some strategies and different programs that are evidence based that, uh, you know, you might want to consider kind of utilizing, but it, but it's, there's no one size fits all, frankly. And, uh, and, and at the end of the day, you know, many times, you know, what, what works really well in a jurisdiction right next to like it, it geographically right next to your community may not work at all in your community for a variety of reasons, including buy-in, uh, um, just capacity. There's just a ton of different, uh, different pieces. So um, I know that's probably not the answer you want to hear, but uh, I think that it's, it's a fair one and one that um, I, I just encourages you to look a little bit more at the resources to kind of identify, um, you know, what might fit best based on what you know of the current issue. Great. Thanks, Scott. And just a heads up, uh, we went ahead and posted that uh, fact sheet um, for CVI in the chat there, if you wanted to uh, speak on that at all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Do you want to, can you, so, um, yeah, so I don't know if you want to, can you pull that up or no? Uh, yeah, I should be able to do that. Let me, uh, I'll have to maybe do a screen no, share. Okay. Uh, you know, just uh, people can look, it's, it's okay. It, it's okay either way. Um, but there is a fact sheet that on April 7th, the uh, White House administration, um, the White House put out around, from the Biden-Harris administration around investments in community violence interventions. We heard, I saw a couple of tweet of, of email chats asking what are community violence interventions. And I think that this fact sheet talk about the proven community violence interventions and, um, you know, like they, they provide examples like violence interrupters program, uh, hospital-based violence intervention um, and, and how these programs have reduced homicides and percentages. I mean, so basically it gives you an idea of the types of initiatives that would um, be considered community violence interventions. I mean, it, and it, there's a ton of linkages to this, uh, to this um, press release. This press release actually identifies this solicitation as a, as a key piece that would be, um, you know, that would be, um, that is part of kind of pulling and supporting this this overall uh, CVI initiative. So um, I think uh, if if you have questions once you look at that, I mean I think there's like I said there's a myriad of resources in that. Um, this is um, you know this may be really helpful in helping you identify the types of uh, of initiatives if you were looking to go for that priority consideration of a CVI focused strategy. Okay, great. Okay, and, I just I wanted people to get their eyes on it, so that's helpful. So thank you. Yeah, sure. I'm just sharing my uh, screen here more momentarily, so I'll yeah, good. stop good. sharing there. Yeah, sure. And again, for folks, uh, that link is indeed there uh, on the uh, inside of the chat there, and uh, I just did a quick screen share so folks can see exactly of what uh, Scott was referencing. I'm going to pull the uh, the PowerPoint back up here shortly, but while that's loading, uh, our second question here that was uh, submitted during the pre-registration portion is what current effective program models uh, that can be replicated in other markets? I feel like you touched on a little bit of that, Scott, but if you yeah. want to speak on that more. Oh, sure. sure. So, so yeah, like, so really it's just like looking at the models program guide on page six of the solicitation, it lists um, links for the Models Program Guide, Crime Solutions, Youth.gov, the National Forum, the National Gang Center site. And then if you go to the National Gang Center site, you look for that program matrix that'll focus on some, you know, effective strategies that you could implement. Again, it may or may not suit your particular needs or interests based on that, uh, you know, a, a multitude of uh, factors and variables. But yeah, it is, it is very much tied into the previous question. and. Uh, and 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 as as that uh, we had a similar we had a solicitation webinar yesterday and 
you know, it's it's difficult, like, you know, to, to, to say it this way, but like it's like saying, really, um, we have identified these broad brush resources and the overall um, goals and deliverables that we want to see come out of this, um, you know, this initiative. But, uh, you know, you build that with those materials. In a way, we provided those raw materials. Um, I hate to sound like a builder, but um, but it's true. And uh, and the, re the reality is we want um, a community-led, community-based, um, comprehensive approach to addressing issues that are specific to your need and your community. And that's just not something we can articulate in any way, shape, or form that would answer that specific need, the specific gap, um, or barriers that you might be currently encountering. So I just want to encourage you to be fully um, to fully explore those if you're planning to move forward with um, with um, a submission, you know, to really to really um, be communicative about what it is in your community um, in terms of statement of the problem that requires um, a solution, you know, and what are some strategies that you you feel you can implement given the resources that you currently have if you were to have these additional financial resources as a successful applicant to this initiative. And um, and I think it, it really kind of flows from there. Um, so again, really encourage you to have a multi-systemic, um, multidisciplinary team as part of the development of this initiative, because ultimately that becomes your basis for your deliverable around uh, the convenient, the collaborative working group. You know, you could have a collaborative working group within it from the very beginning. Um, and what, what's better than knowing all the ins and outs of, and making sure that your approach is informed by as many components and elements of community-based strategizing you can have. So I think that's enough on that piece, hopefully. Okay, great. And uh, Scott, the next pre-submitted question uh, in regards to, uh, can you tell uh, the audience about the number uh, in maximum amount of awards again. Sure. So we, we do, we have received approval to fund up to 11 awards for up to $1 million per award. So, um, so we have $11 million to support 11 sites at 1 million each. With that being uh, said, that million dollars needs to support an initiative for an entire 36 month period. So, um, you know, that's a still very healthy, healthy budget to, to really uh, implement um, some, some pretty uh, impactful um, reductions within your community, in my estimation. So I think, uh, um, yep, so that's it. So it's up to, um, it's certainly, we, we, you know, we don't, that, that's what we have to work with. So um, that's it on that. Okay. May either a municipality or is police department apply? Sure, um, certainly. Um, yeah, that's certainly certainly um, allowable. I would encourage if um, if it is a a department, a police department. I would think that, and we've had in. I'm just looking at our like FY20 comprehensive anti gang program um, funded sites. We had six departments that were funded for that initiative under um, um, an FY20. And a couple of those um, departments were focusing on kind of intervention type programming, not like heavy suppression enforcement type work. So my only, and, and, and certainly you can, um, as a police department, you can focus on what your priorities are, but whether it be intervention or suppression, um, I, so really the larger point is that a police department doesn't necessarily have to focus on suppression efforts. There are many departments that are focused on intervention and you know, prevention oriented initiatives. And so, I, but I would encourage if it is a department that's applying uh, to, really, to really underscore the community um, involvement at, at, from the onset in terms of the support, um, because I think it's gonna be really important in this, uh, current reality that a department can be able to articulate how they're able to um, um, able to work within that within that broader community environment and just from a conceptual 
application process um, and show the supports that would come forward with that. But certainly, yeah, the departments, but it be municipal, local, uh, um, tr tribal, um, or all the way up to, uh, you know, state agency, um, certainly would be eligible. Great. Um, Scott, we're getting close to about time uh, in about 10 minutes. So if it's okay with you, uh, I'll ask, I have one more of the pre-submitted questions that I'll ask because I want to provide the sure. resources that you have in here. But then I did want to go over into the live questions if that was okay. Um, okay. So the next pre-submitted question it simply just said uh, allowable cost question mark uh, here, but I'm sure they, they wanted to maybe get more guidance on the allowable cost. Uh, did you want to speak to allowable cost? And also, uh, I'll have my co-host to uh, paste the OJP financial guide in the chat here to help with uh, guidance around that as well. As, as oh, sure, too. absolutely. Sure. So if, if you um, if you click on that link, there's um, you can scroll down and you go down to uh, um, there's a PDF of our financial guide and uh, you can um, you can kind of see a ton of Kind of great. Uh, it's, it's it's a great read. It's been updated recently, um, but it's uh, you, the allowable costs are. I mean, uh, initially focus on what your what your um, initiative really yearns to you know to address. Um, I think that that's going to be you know the first piece. If there's something that's not allowable in the, your submission as it's uh, presented. Um, if, if you had a strong application and it was recommended for funding, then at that point, our chief financial officer and through our review of our budget review makes determination of what, you know, what's, you know, what can be included and what cannot. So, um, you know, generally speaking, um, I'm going to talk about some things that are disallowable. Uh, generally speaking, um, food um, is not something that um, we we support um, unless it has a, a substantial um, review and approval process. But generally speaking, that's not a, an approved item. So, and I know that makes it difficult for many that might be doing some sort of after school initiative that might require, you know, some extended period of time, or you might need to have some sort of, um, um, you know, um, food for um, sustenance. Um, so I would just encourage you if if, if you are if you have the resources to look at non-federal um, for any sort of food pieces, I would I would not even consider including that in in um, in your design. Um, uh, there's questions about um, vehicles. Um, while not strictly prohibited, it's very it's it's very questionable. Um, and um, I, I just think that um, you would have to really make a strong case as to why, how, like, if you were looking to utilize the funds for a potential purchase of a vehicle, um, you know, being able to articulate in very clear terms, um, you know, um, how that would um, ultimately support the uh, overall uh, efficacy of your, um, of your initiative, you know. Um, so I think those are, but, but you know, we want to make sure that you're in line with your uh, indirect cost rate in terms of if you, if you have an indirect cost rate, you know, that you have, um, we, we don't pay typically for overtime for, um, there's a, there's some limitations on overtime um, for law enforcement. Um, um, there are some, it's not strictly prohibited, but there are some limitations in terms of, uh, um, and we could talk about those, but these are all things that can get, addressed um, um, either through, if you, if you have a specific question as you're developing your design, you can post that to the um, response center and we can get a response to you. Um, and I think we can handle more on an individual basis because there's always these one-offs and it's very difficult to generally, generalizably talk about allowable uh, expenses. I would encourage you to look at the financial guide to see typically what a, you know, typically a personnel, contractual, um, you know, there's categories for, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for um, uh, travel, for uh, supplies. There's another category. I mean, you, you know, I think you first conceptually build it and then if you have questions before submission that you want to have addressed, certainly you could ask and we can try to get those addressed. Otherwise, um, you know, if you were successful, 
Um, and, and really, I just think about think about it this way: what that if it's needed, if it's necessary for the ability to um, implement your initiative as designed. And if so, I would I would I would be of the ilk that you would include it in your initial submission. Um, but I would take the time to look at the financial guide and look at what is considered allowable or not to get a sense of uh, how you feel um, if, if you meet that standard. But um, typically, um, most most jurisdictions submit consistent with what would be required for their initiative to move forward. But again, even if you were uh, successful in submitting an application, you know that doesn't that that budget's not cleared and approved and all costs considered allowable until it goes through a pretty stringent review process. So that could be something that is addressed to the fullest a little later down the road if you were successful. Okay. Scott, we have about time for a few more questions. Uh, I'm asking these questions as they've come in via uh, multiple sources, meaning several people have asked this particular question. Uh, so for okay. those audience members who are hearing this, if it sounds like a version of your question, it's because I'm summarizing for time purposes and because multiple people have asked this similar or same question. The first question was, uh, where are the three cross-site meetings held? for budgeting? Okay, the answer is yes. Um, and that's a great question, and we, we, we have no idea. Um, these are, these meetings are, um, you know, identified in, in consultation with our National Gang Center um, to, a, you know, they, they get through a process uh, to, a, you know, a bidding process to kind of identify and determine um, in consultation with OGDP, and then, um, you know, we identify and land on the site. And um, you know, then and hope for the best that uh, we're able to to actually have in-person meetings at one point. Currently, the current reality is, is that um, you know um, we are we are strictly virtual when it comes to meetings and and federally funded meetings, um, which has resulted in a you know um, that cross-site meet like the, the the cluster meeting for our, our FY19 and FY20 sites. Um, uh, that were recently funded um, to not not have an in-person meeting. They've been virtual, um, so we do hope to have in-person meetings again. But we, we typically, uh, you know, we 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 will know several months, um, if not more, in advance, um, and we will make that clear. So that's a great question from a budgeting perspective. I think that you know you think about what what's um, if you live near a big hub. Let's say you're near in Indianapolis, where you know you can get pretty much to, you know, other metro areas for a particular average cost, you kind of function that in. We do look at jurisdictions that are easily accessible from major airports. So you wouldn't be looking at like, um, you know, like a really small, uh, like you having to drive 300 miles to an airport to then have to fly somewhere and then drive uh, another long distance. So the reality is, my point is, is that if you live in a very rural area where it's pretty high cost with uh, with like, you know, they don't have like these bigger carriers coming in, you know, look at what the kind of the average cost would be for a flight to go to and or like one of the larger, you know, cities and, uh, you know, identify that as, um, you know, as kind of your baseline for um, for a ticket and then, uh, you know, look at the per diem. There's a per, there's a per diem site for federal lodging. You just Google federal lodging per diem and uh, that'll kind of give you what your, uh, what, what the rates are for hotels. I mean, it's just general, but, um, but it'll give you a sense. And, you know, you can always budget a little more, uh, you know, and then reallocate down the road if need be. Um, hopefully that's helpful. I know it's a little difficult, right? Because we're asking you to budget for something that is a, that is a known unknown, um, but I still think it's better to have a ballpark landing place than to not have it at all in your budget. Okay, and Scott, the last question is going to be kind of two questions combined. That will probably be our last question for uh, questions. Excuse me for the afternoon. Uh, uh, so I'm going to read them a little slow just so you can uh, understand. Again, these are kind of hybrid questions that are asked from multiple lo uh, folks here. Um, is it better to submit a joint application for one organization to apply and request uh, to subaward to specific organizations? Uh, 
do you recommend a specific approach? And again, there were several people asking specifically about joint applications. So even Scott, if you want to maybe speak too broadly sure. about joint applications, mm -hmm. multiple people asked around that. And then the second part of the question is multi-site. Several people asked uh, about the consideration of uh, a multi-sided uh, proposal that comes in. So yeah, if you want to okay. speak to maybe the joint application slash the multi-site, sure. that seems to be an overall theme that at least uh, 10 or 15 folks have asked about here. No, that's great. No, and these are, these are great. And I'm really, I'm really appreciative to hear that that's a theme because it shows that there's an interest and a, and a need and that frankly, there's a capacity potentially within the communities that are listening in, in today. So that's encouraging. So we'll just spend a minute on the joint app piece. Um, so, I, I would say sit down with um, those joint sites, sit down as a duo, trio, whatever it, is, it looks like, uh, sit down as a team and really look through what the requirements are from the financial questionnaire, the capabilities piece, and just try to, that will help you determine kind of who might be a better fit as that, because you're gonna have to have a lead organization if you do go join, right? I mean, it still is one, if it's joint, there's still a primary applicant. That is, that the name will not say um, um, organization A and organization B. There's only one organization that's funded. So I know we say joint application, but the reality is it's um, a joint application in terms of how you envision it as two organizations kind of working together. But ultimately, it's one organization, it's the organization, there's only one DUNS number organization that's ultimately going to be responsible for the submission of the reports and all that stuff. So I would say that a joint applicant application will require definitely a pretty good trust level of trust from um, the organizations that are looking to pair together. And I think we just look at do a little asset mapping of what, you know, who is going to be the better, uh, you know, more, more uh, cap like in more able to respond to some of the administrative uh, requirements and uh, of, of the solicitation and the ongoing award if, if successful. So in essence, um, you know, a, a joint application, an applicant, it, it's a joint vision, right? And it's a submission and uh, it, would, it could definitely, it would fund multiple um, sites in that way, but um, it ultimately would look like a subcontract uh, really to one of those joint applicants, if you will. Does that make sense? Hopefully it makes sense. So, you know, if you had organization A that said, I can definitely address all this and I'll take on the, the responsibility of submitting all the stuff, of course, with the support of applicant um, B, then it would ultimately be applicant A would be the name of the of the grantee and applicant B would be listed as a as a sub um, as a sub recipient because you can't have two listed on one um, cover sheet. Um, so that kind of then leads me into this multi-site approach. Um, I am multi-site could mean you have an organization that has multiple sites or you could have different organizations at different sites. Um, and either, either way, I think it comes down to what's realistic and what's measurable and making sure that you're going to be able to have a consistent uh, implementation if you're looking to do if you're looking to do similar things in a particular two different communities, if you're looking to do a particular approach in one community and a different approach in a neighboring community, that's totally fine too. Uh, but it would require a similar, uh, I think, synergy and uh, conversation with um, with those multiple sites to figure out uh, how you would uh, how the multiple sites would support the larger vision of the overall initiative that you're building. And I would just caution um, individuals, um, like applicants that are looking to do a multi-site approach. I think, I think it's great and it can be done in a couple or a few communities, but you really do need to, I mean, that is quite an endeavor to figure out how to, how to, um, how to manage that. And I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm just suggesting that um, it requires a lot of coordination, communication, and, uh, and uh, so I think as you talk through what a joint application might look like, or as you talk through what a multi-site approach might look like, I think some of the answers to that and some of the 
brainstorming, forming, uh, norming things that'll come out of those conversations will ultimately help frame and shape the strategy that you ultimately would, would end up potentially submitting. Um, so I think it's I think it's great. I'm glad to hear that because it sounds like there's 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 multiple um, in uh, multiple uh, uh, resources within communities that potentially are looking to figure out how to how to hitch wagons, if you will. And I think that's exciting. All right. With that, uh, that will be our last question for the afternoon. Thank you so much for providing that, Scott. And again, to our audience members, we know we've missed uh, some questions. And as we stated in the beginning and stated here, uh, any questions that were not answered, please be sure to direct those to the response center to NCJRS. Uh, the information is indeed up on your screen here, and it's also in the chat. Uh, it'll be posted again by my co-host shortly. Um, as well. So again, thank you, Scott, and thank you to our audience for taking in and thank you all in advance for sending in those questions before uh, I let you go. Uh, just be mindful of just grants and this was uh, mentioned before. Here's the URL that's again accessible in your uh, uh, file there that you're able to download for today's um, solicitation webinar. So the URL is accessible there. Be sure to go and access uh, in your file there this URL. Uh, please note that um, OJJDP's contact information is here on this particular slide. Also be sure to go to Facebook uh, and check us out at OJJDP TTA. Um, do you, if you want to get in contact with OJJDP's help desk, this information again was put in the chat, but it's also here. You can reach out to the help desk if you need assistance with getting in those any materials related to today's web event or previous web events as well. Uh, if you would like to uh, contact OJJDP, please note the OJJDP website is here. The OJJDP website is uh, indeed uh, accessible where it also includes a funding page that will uh, also includes uh, this current uh, solicitation that is open and available with uh, the additional details. Uh, sign up for OJJDP's Juve Just at the link here, and also be sure to uh, view upcoming events at the events page uh, on OJJDP's website. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Be sure to submit a request via OJJDP's TTA 360 platform. The platform can be accessed through the uh, URL uh, that is displayed on this slide. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, past web events are archived on OJJDP's multimedia page. If you would like to receive supporting materials for any of those uh, web events, you can do so by going to the OJJDP TTA Help Desk, uh, contacting the Help Desk, and we can get those materials to you. Uh, and finally, a couple of plugs for some upcoming web events that we have uh, that we'll be hosting with INTAC, which includes our expungement of juvenile records uh, web event, Misconceptions, Collateral Consequences, Emerging Practices, uh, that will be tomorrow afternoon. Uh, plenty of room to register for that event, so when you get a chance, please go to that webinar and register for that uh, webinar that has become very popular uh, over the week. So please be sure to register for that, attend, and learn more around uh, that topic area. Uh, the pro prosecuting carjacking cases in juvenile court, uh, please note that this is with our colleagues with the National District Attorneys Association and will be a webinar that is only for prosecutors, prosecutors only. Uh, so please be, note that a uh, registration process and approval process is required for this particular web event with NDAA. Uh, we have additional upcoming uh, uh, solicitation webinars in June that are uh, coming up, one on families-based alternative sentencing and then the other uh, part one of Title II uh, that will be coming up in June. Those are available for registration to attend and learn more about those grant solicitations. And then part two of Title II, uh, the Title II solicitation webinars are broken into two parts, uh, one uh, that will review programmatic and then the second will re review the complaint client side of that particular solicitation. So be sure to register and attend those web events uh, coming up in June. 
Uh, finally, uh, last but certainly not least, we have one last poll question that we want to ask folks before they log out. And basically what we want to know is, how do you plan to apply the information um, that you learned during this web event? Uh, please note that you have multiple options uh, here for this poll question. So feel free to select uh, multiple options here for this particular poll question. And again, we want to know how do you plan to apply the information that you learned here. That being said, uh, we're a couple minutes over, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, bid everyone a great afternoon and thank you all again for joining today's web event. Take care and uh, stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.